Hello there, and welcome to Chazzy Burger Plays Dominions 4. <clears throat> now, Dominions 4 is a uh, sort of very large turn based strategy developed by uh, the guys over at Illwinter. It's a um, it's rather a niche uh, game, but it's a game I quite enjoy, and uh, hopefully you'll either enjoy yourself just now, or you'll come to like it. It's uh, be quite difficult and quite dark, but um, yeah, let's see how it goes. So, we're gonna create a new game and we're gonna go for a. I think we're gonna do like one sort of test uh, and just see how things go. So, we're gonna play on a small random map, I think. Yep, we're gonna enter this game as Let's Play. That's not a valid name, so uh, we'll ignore that. Let's Play. And now I think we're gonna start in the uh, the early ages because that's the one with most magic and magic is most fun. Now, as our nation, I think the way we're gonna play this game is we're gonna play as if uh, I think we're gonna play as the nation of Oom. And what we're gonna be trying to do is we're gonna be trying to uh, bring in the age of man because there's gonna be all these different. Uh, nations full of weird, wonderful, magical things, but we are wanting to bring in the Age of Man through our, uh, through the will and skill of men. So we're going to have, we're going to be against two AIs, two normal AIs, and uh, this is a starting. So the Ulm is a land of cold mountains and dense forests. These wild lands were settled by proud and fierce barbarians in past ages. Their ancestry has made the inhabitants of the forest stronger and more resilient to the cold climate than ordinary men. Upon becoming men, youngsters are given a single knife and left in the forest at first snowfall. Those who survive the winter are allowed to return to their family. The bar barbarians of Ulm live in small settlements ruled by chieftains and warrior smiths who search for the enigma of steel. Steel is sacred metal and its maker is as well. Smithing has become the equivalent of making a sacrifice to the Lord and no other culture has developed such skill in forging magical items. Horses are rare and those who use them in warfare are held in contempt. Sneak attacks, on the other hand, are common. Many warriors use stealth to engage opponents in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So, that's who we are. We are a race of, sort of barbarian men who prefer the cold. So yeah, we prefer the cold scale one. We'll get to that in a bit. We start looking at our scales. Our military, we have strong medium infantry and we have stealthy infantry. Now those can be both used. Medium infantry means they'll have uh, some form of like shields and some armor. They won't be like um, horseless knights or anything, but they will be sort of. They'll be reasonable. They'll be able to do their own sort of thing. They might not be able to hold their own against the sort of enemies we'll be facing, but we'll find that out soon enough. Um, so our magic, we've got earth magic, nature magic, fire magic, air, water, some death, and superior magic item forging, which is something we're going to be hopefully using quite a lot. And we also have quite a weak priest, so now we get to select our physical form. So these are all the different forms that we can take. For example, we could be uh, this one, the Son of Fenrir, where uh, you play as the uh, pretender god uh, who is a massive wolf. Now, um, there's loads of different uh, ways we can play this game. We can play pretty much anything, but I think, personally, we're going to play as this guy, the Idol of Men. This idol has been around for a very long time and it's always been the most popular place to give your offerings. Through the ages, warriors have offered it valuables to receive courage in battle, wives have offered food before giving birth, and an idol of men has continued to grow in power. Countless offerings later, now with the pan creator god gone, the idol of men has a chance of putting the world under its strong dominion and become the true god. Now the thing about this is we're going to choose this guy and he's going to be a uh, an immobile pretender. Usually you'd have a uh, games where people's pretenders are things like um, Titan, like you might have an underwater nation with the Titan of the Sea which will be like Poseidon and he will lead their armies and he will be in the thick of it casting spells or something like that but instead I think we're going to play the game where we're going to have an immobile pretender with a very very strong dominion with uh, very good scales, don't worry I'll get to this in a second while we go through uh, dominion uh, pretender creation so here you can see some of the traits. Uh, we start off with level 1 in fire, level 1 in air, level 1 in nature. Uh, it creates 11 research points. It's an amphibian, so uh, you can have it in an underwater province if you so decide. It's uh, 
blunt resistant, which means it's difficult to damage with blunt weapons and only take half the damage. Pierce resistant, same thing, but for piercing weapons like spears. Shock resistant, because it's made out of stone, it uh, takes less damage from shocking spells. Fire resistant, so it takes less damage from fire. It does not take less damage from cold, you'll notice. So uh, a frost mage could kill us. Like, uh, it does have 120 uh, hit points. And it is size 6, but uh, it, c it can die. It's uh, poison resistant, so incredibly in poison resistant, so poison does nothing to it. It's lifeless, and that means that it's uh, animated by strong magics, they lack life force, and thus unaffected by certain spells such as a drain, life, sleep, and polymorph. So it needs not eat, so it doesn't need to eat. It gives a 10 supply bonus, so we're able to feed 10 more men. And it's an innate spellcaster, which means it can cast spells in the same combat round as they move or attack. Uh, so it can't... Um, it can't uh, move, and it can't attack, so it's just a usual spellcaster. Uh, I don't know if that means it can cast two spells at once, which could be quite useful, but uh, yeah. You'll see that it actually has an attack skill of five, I'm not sure how it does that. Uh, kind of looks at you a bit menacingly, I think. So yes, we're going to choose the Idol of Men. Now what that does is it gives us a dominion of four uh, dominion strength, and then we've got the Idol to Order to Turmoil scale. The production sloth scale, the heat cold scale, the growth death scale, fortune and misfortune scale, and growth or magic drain scale. Now, what all these do is they uh, they change how your dominion is. So, uh, say for example, if I want to spend points in getting order, all that'll do is it'll increase our income by 12, 15 percent, unrest reduction by three, and we'll get less events. So we'll get 6% less events. And now what these do is these cost design points. So your pretender uh, chassis, as it's called, costs points. If we go back to here, you can see that uh, you could get a tree, for example, for zero points, and that would give you uh, Dominion 4, 3 uh, Nature Magic. Which is, you know, it's pretty good. New Magic Pass costs 60, but, uh, you know, could be worth playing as a tree. You could go as a monolith, you could go as the Oracle. Uh, might play as the Oracle, I'm not sure. I was thinking about the uh, Idol of Men, just because I think it sounds a little uh, better, but then again, having three Astral could be really nice. And uh, now we'll just stick to the Idol of Men for now. So um, we have 330 design points that we get to spend on our magic and our scales. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to buff our Dominion strength up to 8. So we have an incredibly strong Dominion. But I might bump that to back down to 7. Uh, and then we're going to have massive scales, so uh, we're going to have Order 3, Production 3, Growth 3, and uh, I think we'll just leave magic by itself. Yeah, I think we'll just leave magic by itself. So, um, this means that our Dominion will enable us to get more money, produce more troops, and get more people so we can get more money and more production. So we're going to go for a, uh, a not very active pretender. We're not really going for someone who gets involved a lot. What we will do, however, is we will increase some of our uh, pretender magic paths. Can we up? No, we can't. Okay, so we've got a 4-3-1 pretender. We've got 4 in fire, 3 in air, 1 in nature. Um, with 7 dominion strength, 3 order, 3 productivity, and 3 growth. And uh, I think that's how it'll go. So we're going to name this god the. Come on, Shifty. Doesn't seem to want to work. Okay, that's weird. So we call it the Idol of Man. So all praise the Idol of Man. Uh, and this is just game settings. We're going to leave it be and uh, set up. So now what will happen is it's just generating our uh, our map for us. Um, you have a choice of playing in pre-rendered maps uh, with the game that you can download that either someone's made or they come with the game. Um, you've got random map generation, so you can have small maps, large maps, uh, medium maps, uh, and it will randomly generate a bunch of provinces and stick them all together in a world. And it can be quite good. Sometimes it can be very skewed. You could do something like uh, you can maybe start off in like a marsh and have marsh surrounding you, and at that point you're kind of screwed because your capital is where you have the most people. And if your tax base isn't very good because you're in a marsh, then you're pretty fucked. So anyway, yes, the Idle Man, the god of Ulm, spring in the first year of the Ascension Wars. 
In the beginning, there was chaos. Out of chaos arose worlds populated with multiple of be multitudes of beings. Wars were fought, kings and emperors rose and fell, and civilizations were built and crumbled as millennia passed. Gods, dark and strange, were worked in paid worshipped in pagan temples. Still there was chaos. The gods fought among themselves, bringing even greater ruin to those who would serve them. At last there was one, a being of great power and enlightenment, who rose above his immortal peers and cast them out of the heavens into oblivion. From chaos came order, and with order came peace. The creatures of the worlds flourished. The age of chaos had ended. Now the wheel has turned once again. The supreme god has suddenly disappeared. Prayers are left unanswered. The smoke of offerings rises in vain to the heavens. No one knows why he disappeared, but it is certain the people of the world are once again left without direction, without guiding principle, without order. Now is the time for the beings of great power and ambition to try their strength. The throne of the heavens stands empty, and only the strongest can rise to the supremacy, supremacy over all. Only the most powerful can ascend to take place of he who came before. This is a time of great strife and suffering. This is a time of magic unequal. This is the Ascension Wars. So what the game is, is our protect god. They really weren't kidding when they said a small map, were they? This is, uh, this is incredibly small. As you can see, this is a, actually a wraparound. So this province here is actually this province here. So this, we're just going across the world. I have a feeling, though, seeing as one of these, uh, see these things here? These are called Thrones of Ascension. Now, to win the game, we need to have three Thrones of Ascension, because that's how it was in the victory conditions. So there's two thrones that are very, very, not very far away from where we live. This is our capital here. This is Ulm. 29,000 people, almost 30,000. Uh, one of them is in the sea, which makes me believe that there's one race uh, of sea, of an underwater nation. So you've got your land nations, you've got underwater nations. So I think that we are going to be on land, kind of in the middle of it, against one, uh, one other land nation and then an underwater nation. So I think what we'll be able to do is we'll be able to take out this uh, land nation because it will probably be on the uh, that the uh, the land nation will between be between us and the sea nation I would imagine. So I think it would be quite easy for us to take them out. So without further ado, let us get into the thing. So uh, right now we have uh, our warrior chief Judbert and a scout called Tadika. And uh, well, Warrior Chief has 25 men in his army. He's got a brigade of archers, 15 archers, and a brigade of axe warriors. Now, what we're going to do is going to go to the recruit units screen. We're going to recruit a Warrior Smith, who, uh, if we have a look at, the Warrior Smiths are rulers of the tribes of Ulm. Every tribe is led by a chieftain, a shaman, and a smith. The chieftain rules in matters of war, the shaman in spiritual matters, and the smith in ju judicial matters. They alone have mastered the Enigma steel, and they make the weapons and armors used in tribal wars. Smithing has become the equivalent of making a sacrifice to the Lord, and no other culture develops such skill in magical forging. Warrior smiths are skilled in earth and other elemental lag magic. So as you can see, they start with earth level 1. They have a 100% chance of getting another level in a possible path, either fire, air, water, or earth. And another 50% chance to get another plus 1 on either fire, air, water, or earth. It just depends what they get. They uh, have 9 research ability, they're cold resistant, they have mountain survival. Now what, what survival means is they can move through those provinces without penalty, so it would be like a normal province where you can move uh, two provinces a turn. And they're less likely to sar when the army runs out of supplies in these provinces. So if you leave troops in a uh, province without supplies, they will start to starve to death. Units with mountain survival are also able to move through mountain passes when it's not too cold. So what we can do is we can recruit uh, mountain warriors who are here, and what they can do is they can move through uh, mountain tiles when it's too cold to move through otherwise. So you can attack without uh, without needing to be summoned. Hannibal, eat your heart out. Uh, so with that, I think we're going to start recruiting our army, and we're going to recruit these things called Warrior Maidens. Now these are women who give up on the prospect of rearing a family and may choose to marry the spirits of war. Those maiden Warrior Maidens do not fight only to defend their village, but to do join their fellow men in a conquest. Warrior Maidens use scale mail cuirasses, which give good protection and maneuverability. So what we're going to do is we're going to recruit uh, five Warrior Maiden Archers, and then five 
warrior ma shield maidens. So some girls of exceptional bravery are trained in melee combat rather than archery. Shield maidens fight with a short sword and shield weapons not used by the menfolk of Ulm. All men of Ulm fight with two weapons, one in each hand, usually either axes or swords or throwing axes or something like that. The use of shields was once despised as cowardly in Ulm, but since the shield maidens came out victorious from a number of battles in which they are outnumbered, they have become respected and considered a force to be reckoned with. Once again showing us men that we're stupid. So yep, we're going to recruit that and we're going to repeat that. Very good. Now if we look at Judbert, we're going to ask him to become the Prophet. So by becoming the Prophet, he's going to be our representative in the uh, in the world. We're going to have our idol, our idol of men, who's going to be sitting in a room throughout the game, because he can't really move unless we research uh, teleportation. Even then, he doesn't have the astral power to teleport unless we give him astral gems. Gems, as you can see up here, are... Uh, different numbers we get. So we get two uh, nature gems a month, one death gem a month, and three earth gems. Now gems are used in uh, rituals or casting spells, that kind of thing. Um, and we'll get more into that later. Going back to our pretender, our pretender is going to be immobile. He won't be able, he'll be able to lead troops, but he won't be able to move from, uh, from our capital without magical assistance. So we're going to have Judbert uh, be our, uh, our almost... Um, how you say, representative to the world. He's going to be the one leading our armies across the world. Him and a bunch of other commanders. But he will be leading the charge. He will be our holy warrior. He will become uh, a priest. And he'll be able to pre preach our dominion uh, and show the world that we mean business. Now, we've actually got a very nice start with them. We've got five different provinces around us. We've got one forest province, which is good resources, hinders movement. We've got... Uh, quite a few bordered mountain provinces with low income, excellent resources. Now, we love resources as well. Uh, the more resources we can get, the better. It means more troops we can recruit. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to send out our scout downwards towards this throne. What we really need to do is we need to find this, uh, this other pretender and kill him quickly. If we do that, we'll be fine. We're also going to uh, go towards this thing here. Gift of Flight. Not Gift of Flight. Sorry. Uh, we're, what are we looking for? We're looking for, um, might be alteration magic now that I think of it. Uh, yes, I believe it is alteration ma magic at some point. There we go, wind guide, level 4. Now what this does is it makes all of our units shoot uh, much more accurately. So that's what we want to magically research. It will also give us a bunch of other things. We'll be able to increase the strength of our uh, units using earth magic, which is another one we're rather good at. If you look at uh, a warrior smith again, they have a chance to get air and earth magic, so... What we'll do is we're going to have lots of warrior smiths being produced because uh, each time they, um, they're recruited, what they do is they give a five resource bonus in whatever province they're in. So we can make Ulma an absolute powerhouse in recruiting units. Uh, and they also give a forge bonus. They use one less gem uh, whenever they create something, which is actually rather good. I quite like that. So what we're going to do is we're going to end this turn here. And there we go. We have a, proc a proclamation from Um. Judbert the warrior chief shall here be known as the prophet of the idol of man. And a proclamation from Atlantis, that's the underwater nation I was talking about. Xanthus the coral commander shall hereby be known as the prophet of Lothar. And suddenly, Varan Harris, the son of steel, appeared at the gates of Um. Yep, and he wants to fight for our cause, so that's really good. That's a random chance we have of uh, getting... A, uh, a hero, Warren Harris, the son of steel. We'll get into him next time. We also got a three earth uh, warrior smith, so that's also good. But uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to leave that there. That's a set up the game, and uh, hopefully I'll see you guys next time. So, uh, ta ta.